Now we're going to examine the effects of heart rate and cardiac output and how we can then affect heart rate. So if I can alter heart rate, remember, I can then affect cardiac output. So how can I change heart rate? Well, I can do it, one, with the nervous system, particularly the autonomic nervous system, and either through sympathetic or parasympathetic impulses. And we've talked about this as examples of sympathetic or parasympathetic effects. So now we're ready to look at the actual mechanism that is involved in altering heart rate. So here we have norepinephrine and epinephrine for the sympathetic nervous system binding to beta adrenergic receptors and that triggers the second messenger system. Now that second messenger system then ends with protein kinase. Protein kinase will cause an increase in the number of sodium channels and calcium channels, but let's pay attention to the sodium. Now if I have more sodium channels in autorhythmic cells, if you remember, it's that leaking of sodium into the cell that takes that cell to threshold, then you get depolarization, repolarization. You get the action potential. So if I have more sodium channels leaking, then I'm going to get to threshold sooner, and then I get the action potential sooner. So that will give us, raise our heart rate. The other side of the autonomic nervous system, of course, is the parasympathetic. Now in this one, it's acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. It binds to muscarinic receptors. That triggers a second messenger system that ends up opening up potassium channels. Now potassium, remember, is concentrated inside, so potassium is going to diffuse out. Now again, in those autorhythmic cells where you've got sodium leaking in, raising the membrane potential to get it to threshold, now I've got at the same time potassium leaking out. Both of them are positively charged, so it's like they're canceling each other out. My membrane potential won't rise as quickly because it's going to take a lot more sodium or a lot more time to counteract the effects of the potassium leaking out. So it takes longer to get to threshold, which means then that my heart rate is going to decrease and that would be the parasympathetic effect. And we can see the example here or, or comparison of the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So look here, we've got the rest, resting um, pacemaker potential of those autorhythmic cells, okay? Whereas the blue is the pacemaker potential under parasympathetic influence, and the green is the pacemaker potential under sympathetic stimulation. So let's first again look at just at rest, assuming there's not really any input from parasympathetic or sympathetic. Here's the leaking part. So the sodium is leaking in, adding pause in the inside, making it less negative. I hit threshold, I have an action potential. If I hit it with, or with norepinephrine from the sympathetic nervous system, that's going to open up more sodium channels, which means it leaks faster and gets the threshold faster. Under parasympathetic stimulation, while sodium is leaking in, potassium is going to be leaking out, and so therefore it takes longer to get to threshold. So it would slow your heart rate down. Now vagal tone refers to the parasympathetic influence over our heart rate. If I could rip somebody's heart out of their chest, so I did the Indiana Jones trick, and hold their heart in my hand, if it could still beat, it would actually beat at 110 to 100 to 110 beats per minute. That's called the intrinsic heart rate. So the heart rate without any nerve input at all is about 100 to 110 beats per minute. But our resting heart rate's at 70. So why isn't our heart beating at 100 beats per minute at rest in our chest with the nerve connection. Well, that has to do with the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system on the heart. So if we look on this slide here, you can see here's the intrinsic heart rate. To lower heart rate, notice I have to increase the number of vagal or parasympathetic stimulation. So I have more action potentials coming from the vagus nerve, again parasympathetic, 
I'm going to lower my heart rate. To raise my heart rate, I need more sympathetic input to raise my heart rate. But now our heart rate is down here at about 70. At 70 beats per minute, notice I need a lot of vagal or a lot of parasympathetic stimulation to maintain that lower heart rate at about 70 beats per minute. So that's why I'm saying this is that the heart is under this parasympathetic control because right now while you're sitting watching this video, there are parasympathetic action potentials traveling to your heart to keep your heart rate down at 70 beats per minute. But I can still adjust my heart rate from that point. If I want to lower my heart rate, I just increase the number of parasympathetic um, action potentials arriving at my heart. If I want to increase my heart rate, I'm going to decrease the parasympathetics and increase the sympathetics. So I can still adjust my heart rate. It's just right at rest, we keep that intrinsic rate down by increasing the number of parasympathetic impulses to the heart so I can keep it at about 70. Now, there are, of course, chemical regulation in the heart. We have all kinds of things going on. One, of course, are the hormones. Hormones like epinephrine have the same effect that norepinephrine has from the sympathetic nervous system. So it's going to raise heart rate by increasing the number of sodium channels that are open. There are chronotropic drugs. These are drugs that affect heart rate. So we're gonna have negative chronotropic drugs. These like beta blockers. Beta blockers block norepinephrine. They block that beta adrenergic receptor. Therefore, I can't get sympathetic impulses to um, increase my heart rate because I'm blocking that receptor so norepinephrine can't bind there. I'm not going to get increased number of sodium channels opening. Positive chronotropic drugs are things like beta agonists. That is, they're going to bind to beta adrenergic receptors and act like norepinephrine, so therefore they're going to raise heart rate or atropine, which blocks muscarinic, which is the acetylcholine receptors. I'm, if I block the acetylcholine receptors, I'm blocking the parasympathetic nervous system, so that's also going to raise heart rate. Now this slide just gives a summary of some of the things that we've talked about in all four of these sections about cardiac output. So you want to be familiar with these. Um, again, if we're going to affect cardiac output, we can either do it by affecting stroke volume or heart rate. I can raise heart rate by a number of different things, it decreasing parasympathetic inputs to the heart, increasing sympathetic impulse, impulses to the heart, or increasing plasma epinephrine, because that functions like the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so all those would raise heart rate. If I increase end diastolic ventricular volume, that is I increase preload, that's going to increase stroke volume. If I increase sympathetic input to the heart, so more norepinephrine, that's going to increase stroke volume through enhanced um, contractility. Or plasma epinephrine, same thing, it's going to also increase contact, contractility um, and therefore increase stroke volume. Notice that the parasympathetic does not have any effect on stroke volume. Only the sympathetic does. It has an effect on heart rate, but not on stroke volume. So if I increase stroke volume or heart rate, then I'm going to increase cardiac output. And then when we turn to blood vessels, we'll keep going with this and we'll be using and looking at how cardiac output affects blood pressure. So all these components are going to be important to understanding the next chapter on blood vessels and blood pressure.